All right. Hi, everyone, uh, both to those of you here in person, and we've got a pretty good contingent joining on Zoom as well. Uh, welcome to this Midwest Mechanics Seminar. Uh, the Midwest Mechanics Seminar Series is the preeminent lecture series in mechanics in the U.S. and among the most prestigious in the world. It was established in 1957 as a way to bring prominent speakers, uh, many of whom are members of national academies and so on, uh, to Midwest schools. And it currently involves 10 of the most prominent Midwest uh, engineering universities, including UM, UIUC, Purdue, Wisconsin, and others. Um, I'm thrilled today to introduce our speaker for today, Petros Kumitakis. Uh, Petros is the Herbert S. Williker Jr. Professor of Engineering and Applied Science and the Area Chair for Applied Math at Harvard's John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. He studied naval architecture. He did his undergrad at uh, the National Uni Technical University of Athens and his master's degree right here at the University of Michigan. He also studied aeronautics and applied mathematics where he got his PhD from Caltech. Uh, and he served as the chair of the computational sciences, computational sciences at ETH Zurich uh, for the past uh, 23 years. Petros has uh, earned many honors. He's been elected fellow of ASME, APS, SIAM, uh, to name a few. He's the recipient of many awards, including the Advanced Investigator Award by the European Research Council and the ACM Gordon Bell Prize in Supercomputing. And he's also an elected international member of the US National Academy of Engineering. His research interests are on fundamentals and applications of computing and artificial intelligence to understand, predict, and optimize fluid flows in engineering, nanotechnology, and medicine. He's made many uh, seminal and highly cited contributions in all of these areas. To give a recent example, an annual review, review paper that he co-authored on machine learning and fluid mechanics just last year already has uh, more than 1,000 citations. So we're very happy to have you here today, Petros, and the floor is yours. Yes, it's, it's uh, great to be back to the University of Michigan 36 years later. I'm, I'm 36 pounds heavier, but that's another problem. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, and it's great to see so many old friends and, and, and new colleagues. And uh, I, I very much appreciate all the discussions I had and admire uh, the type of work that you guys are doing here. It's, it's been a great visit. Um, so what I'd like to tell you today is um, uh, how uh, we can take uh, something that we have been doing for the last uh, maybe 30, 40, 50 years, uh, namely scientific computing, and combine it with something that has actually been there for another 40, 50 years, but it's only recently um, come to prominence, artificial intelligence. And I will be arguing that uh, it's not one or the other, but it's actually the fusion of the two something that I will call alloys, that is a very interesting way to study and to understand physics and to control and model um, uh, fluid flows. Before I do that, I'd like to thank all the uh, people who have actually um, done the work. Uh, some of them are still with me, uh, some others they have gone to uh, other places, uh, but uh, I, I'd like to stress that a lot of this work that I'll be presenting uh, today is, is by a collective of, of people and it's not the work of only one person and I think these are uh, colleagues and most of them are actually my former students and postdocs uh, with whom I have uh, been able to do all this work. So, um, one of the key um, things that has been transforming uh, fluid mechanics have been computers. And here is another personal history. These are all the different computers that I had uh, the opportunity uh, to work over the years, starting from uh, the National Tech and University on a digital box in, in the old days. Maybe uh, Nikos here is probably remembering this, this machine to arrive into some of the best supercomputers of our times. And what has been amazing in these capabilities is that uh, something that many, not many of us perhaps realize that I think there is no other machine in the world who has seen about one trillion X in terms of speed up and capabilities over this period of about uh, 35, um, uh, 35, 40 years. Um, and, and, and what we have been doing with this, uh, so in our lab, we have been doing some large scale simulations. So this is a simulation of blood um, and here you see only the blood, you don't see only the, the plasma. Um, this, is, this is blood cells in a microfluidic device. And the idea is that you can use this as a, as a cell sorter 
um, you can embed uh, larger particles than, than, than blood. And then the idea is you're using a, a fluid mechanics principle where the larger particles are hitting on, on the posts and then they are separated while the smaller particles, in this case, the red blood cells, they're um, staying down uh, and, and, and they get this way you can separate perhaps circulating uh, tumor cells from um, blood cells. And of course, by doing computing, you can go inside and visualize and understand and, and look at all these different uh, uh, beautiful things. And you have to appreciate that this is uh, millimeter long devices. Um, here, we have not used so many uh, red blood cells, but this is a simulation that at some point uh, was using one trillion particles um, uh, in, in major supercomputers. Uh, we have been also uh, doing other things that I think many of you also do here. We have been looking into bubbly flows, and we have been developing methods to be able to simulate um, tens of thousands, and we are pushing it to hundreds of thousands of, of bubbles, and we are looking into different phenomena from waves to things like microfluidic crystals, um, and, and we try to study um, uh, different phenomena. And uh, a last uh, and more recent uh, simulation, I'm very much interested in fish swimming. And what you have here is you have 300 um, swimmers. Each one of them is at 500, uh, at 5,000 uh, Reynolds number. There is adaptive mesh refinement around each one of them. The colors that you see are vorticity. Um, uh, we have not done any control here, but we were interested to see if you have large clusters of self-propelled animals, um, do you get uh, drug reduction? Um, uh, there's, there's a lot of physics that's coming in here, and, and uh, this is some of the uh, frontiers of simulations that, that we are doing. Now, every one of these simulations that, that you see um, has taken days and months in supercomputers, and, and uh, is Kasparov not holding his head for that, but uh, is holding his head because uh, computers also have been enabling uh, other entities to, uh, to do things. And actually, when people started to become aware of computers, very much not because these large scale simulations, but when computers started to, uh, to become prominent in things where we thought that um, human intelligence can never be beat. This is the main game of chess. Um, of course, they can also beat us in the game of Go, um, even in Texas poker. And I think there is no week that doesn't go by where you don't see something about artificial intelligence in some of the major magazines like Science and Nature and, and so on. And of course, there's tons of books and, and lots of interesting people that um, talk about AI and, and discuss AI this, AI that, danger, um, and, and, and many other things. But among all these different books, I'd like to stress this book, which is one of my favorites, is written by economists. And economists are very pragmatic people. And, and then they say, where others see transformational new innovation, we see a simple fall in price. And, and the argument here is that what has happened is basically uh, solving complex equations is done more easily and in less time. Um, in our case, we have taken it the other way since we can have computers, we can solve uh, very large uh, systems, uh, but now you can also solve a lot of different systems in less time. And so what is the AI technology that makes cheap? Well, basically you can use computers to make prediction and, and prediction is central to decision making under uncertainty. And if you work in a company, better prediction under uncertainty, this implies new opportunities for all companies. And it's actually a view uh, that you will see me adopting throughout this uh, presentation. So now, um, can we take these ideas and try to do um, something about problems that we care? Uh, we are very often interested in complex multi-scale systems for climate, ocean currents, turbulence, and, and proteins. Um, there's scales that go from the nanometer to the kilometer. And then um, all of these things are, are very um, expensive, they're challenging to simulate. Um, so can we uh, use ideas from artificial intelligence to do predictions and to do predictions under uncertainty? So, um, so how can we uh, harness the potential of AI? And I'd like to argue and, and be critical whether actually AI does have such a potential to give us uh, such predictions. Um, so what you will see is you will not see a glorified um, 
um, representation of AI, but I will be quite critical. And, and uh, I would like to stress not only successes, uh, but perhaps I I'd like to also emphasize failures and to compare success and failures and to see where perhaps there is opportunities um, uh, for people to work on and solve some of the places where we fail in uh, today. So that's the uh, spirit of the talk. So again, working in these things, I started working in these things about, uh, I don't know, what is it, 30 years or so ago. Um, this is a paper um, that uh, took me about three, four years to get through the reviewers. Um, the idea was that there was POD, which was the big thing uh, back in the days in fluid mechanics, that you could do proper orthogonal decomposition. And there was a realization um, that you can write actually the proper orthogonal decomposition as a neural net with two layers. And the neural net is actually having linear activation function. This was not a realization we made, it was made by others. So you could, if you wanted to do POD, you could just take um, uh, the data and teach them to learn themselves. And then if you had two layers of, of an, a network with two layers and linear activation function, the weights of, of the networks will give you the eigenvectors of the POD, which of course made it easy. If you wanna go now from POD and you wanna make a nonlinear POD, if you have the eigenvalue eigenvector problem that you're solving, this is not straightforward to make it a nonlinear uh, enterprise, but if you have neural nets, you can make it nonlinear by changing the activation function of the networks. And actually by accident, because some things were not working, we started adding layers. So this is one of the first calculations doing um, deep neural networks um, by experimentation. And then this is some of the uh, reconstructions that we were getting uh, of the flow um, using the same amount of modes with the uh, um, the original flow, I don't remember what exactly was the quantity. This was the reconstruction you would do the POD and this is the reconstruction that you will do um, with neural networks. And these were two different uh, scenarios. And I, I kept, because it was such an ordeal to publish this paper, I kept some of the reviews that I was getting back then. Um, it took years of reviewing to get it through. So I remember this review in particular, he says, uh, what's the big deal about this approach? It's just better data compression. And, and, and this advantage is lost because of more complex processes necessary in the least minimization uh, problem solved in, in this approach. And then this approach needs more confrontation with more general configurations to be effective. Of course, they never apply the same criticism to POD, but they would apply it to the neural nets in any case. I had to publish this paper, so I said we agree with the referee, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, and I say it's not clear to us how advantages over the POD are lost due to the minimization process, and so on and so forth. Finally, as I said, it took three years, and then, and then we got published. Now, another thing I want to mention, um, uh, so Aaron actually here was very kind to mention this uh, review article. I actually wrote a very similar article uh, about um, 25 or so years ago uh, that actually nobody wanted to publish. And uh, so uh, Parvis Moin and the Center for Turbulence Research were kind enough to allow me to have it as one of the CTR uh, research briefs. Uh, so as you see, it's application of machine learning algorithms to flow modeling and optimization. And actually at that time we were doing machine learning and experiments uh, because simulations were so expensive. So um, the difference between these two articles uh, in, in, from my perspective is what's in between is the speed up of computers uh, over these years. So um, this is uh, the top 500 uh, supercomputer uh, up to this time. This is the number 500. And if you just simply look at this logarithmic plot, you realize that what in 2019 takes three minutes to, to train and the times that we were doing these things would take a year in the same machine, same algorithm, same everything. And of course now algorithms are, are better, but I think this speed up of, of orders of magnitude comes from the machines. So, so now uh, without uh, further history, I'd like to jump if you like, and actually I'd like to, to discuss how can we take all the lessons that we have learned from doing computations in large scale systems and how can we learn, how can we take some of the lessons we have learned from, no pun intended, from machine learning uh, and put them together. Um, so the idea is to make an alloy. And what is the, an alloy? An alloy is a mixture of chemical elements 
Um, and then you can have um, the pure metal, which is one method if you like. You can substitute parts of a method with another method. And of course, you can um, put things in between and, and you can also combine things. Now, if you consider these red things to be the models and numerics and the classical scientific computing we have been doing, and now if you take these green things to be techniques like recurrent neural networks, autoencoders, which are machine learning tools, and I will show you how actually you can replace some parts of numerics with reinforcement learning. I think these are um, a schematic of how I envision numerical methods to happen um, in, in the future. And actually, we're working on them uh, right now uh, on trying to adopt this, this way of developing um, computing alloys. Um, so um, I'd like to show you three of these uh, alloys. Um, I hope you can buy at least one of them. Uh, in any way, the first one is learning the effective dynamics for multi-scale models. Um, the second one, actually the third one, is going to be scientific multi-agent reinforcement learning for closures and flow control. And I will introduce you to optimizing the discrete loss for solving uh, inverse problems. So, and as I said, I'd like to, uh, to show you um, advantages, drawbacks, and, and how we went about to develop things like that. So um, as a way of introducing this LED, let me talk about the kuramoto shivashinsky equation. This is an equation that is being used as a model for various uh, physical systems. It's a fourth order PDE with a negative uh, viscosity, uh, as you see there. Um, and, and then uh, depending on the domain uh, size and depending on the viscosity that you have, you can create a non-dimensional parameter L tilde that I am uh, writing uh, over there. And, and then um, depending on the, the larger the number L tilde, the more that it gets uh, finer and finer structures. <clears throat> so you can know your numerical methods, you can discretize using grid points. Here we can take 512 grid points, and then I can integrate this, um, I can integrate this, uh, this uh, ODEs over here. And now, um, from a perspective of adopting a perspective of data, uh, I, as I am doing all these simulations, what I have done is I have collected uh, a lot of data. I have collected 500,000 samples of the behavior of this system. So what if at the moment I forget that I have an equation, but I have 500,000 samples of a physical system? Can I uh, predict the evolution of the system without knowing the equations from where um, uh, these samples have come from. Um, so here's, uh, here's the, the story. So we have half a million uh, samples. Um, so uh, this is the behavior of the solution. Um, this is over X. And this is if you take this and you put all these curves that I saw as animation, you put them here, you get, um, you get this, um, these contours uh, uh, that I'm showing you. And long story short, we tried to do training with this very high dimensional data. We were not very successful. And then we hit on the idea, what if I do the training, not on the full data, but on some kind of a reduced representation of the data. So the first thing that we did, knowing that coming from uh, POD called PCA in the in machine learning community or singular value decomposition, um, you can uh, take, uh, you throw away, the modes with a low energy. And then what we were thinking is, instead of training on the full dimensional data, let's now uh, use 20 modes as the observables on which we're gonna be training our, um, our uh, recurrent neural networks, which is the next thing that I'm gonna um, show you. So neural networks, there is a, a zoo of, um, of neural nets. Every one of them uh, is a different animal. And, and can have different purposes, and it's an acquired um, knowledge which one to use when. Uh, we're doing time series, so we're going to be looking into this category where um, uh, one uh, input after the other, they have a sequence in time, inputs and outputs. So these are recurrent neural networks, and we're taking advantage of things called long short-term memory, gated uh, recurrent units, and, and, and so on. So, so what is it that we have? We have data, uh, we have the model, uh, we train it, we do an optimization. Um, and then uh, the question is, here is my test data. Uh, here is the SVD that I do to my test data. 
um, and then I put it through my LSTM. Um, I have all these time sequences. These are all the different samples that I, that I mentioned. And then after I do uh, some kind of training up to a certain time, then when I, I want to uh, stop training, and then whatever I have learned from this data, I want to now evolve, um, um, evolve my, uh, my system using my LSTMs. So we did that. So um, I'm sorry. Uh, we did that. And then um, a time uh, zero right after the um, Right after the training, I'm showing you uh, what is the predicted from the um, LSTM and what would be the true um, uh, results of the SVD. And you can follow it here as well. So this is, I have been training up to here. So then I ask my recurrent neural nets, give me the solution on the next time step. And sure enough, they're doing a good job. Um, now they're actually doing a, a good job if I go up to time uh, one, they still, able to capture it up to time two, they're still doing okay. Up to time three, you start to see um, that I have some kind of, a, of, of problems. And then as I move on and I go to time four, these two things are gonna diverge, five. And, and you can see it actually in a more dramatic way here, uh, where this is the predictions in the reduced space and this is the expansion in the high dimensional space. You see that as I increase the, um, the chaoticity of my system, these recurrent neural nets, they start to fail completely out. Um, so, so it's not a good, a good system. Um, so what we, what, we, what we find from this is that um, you have error that accumulates and then this error accumulates. And even though you can predict up to a certain time and I could have shown you results up to a certain time and tell you, look how good it is. You have to ask the question, please play on. And, and when you play on these things, they fail. Um, so it's very difficult to generalize if you have not trained on the, on, on the right distribution. And as the distribution, as, as the distribution of the data changes uh, with the evolution of the system, if you have not trained on that, then I, there is no way that you can, you can get that. Um, there's different ways that you can try to get some statistics. This is a work that we did with Emi um, adding some kind of stochastics where we combine the LSTM with some kind of average uh, behavior of the stochastic properties of the system. Uh, but still, uh, it's something that we weren't able to, uh, to resolve. And also another issue that we had is that we have um, vanishing gradient problems here in training. This has to do with a particular type of networks that we have. As we propagate the error backwards to find out uh, what's the weight of the network, we found that we had um, uh, numerical, um, numerical issues. Um, now, just to show you what happens is uh, one day, this student of mine, uh, Pantelis Vlachas, who was doing these results, uh, he says, I want to show you something. And he says, our work is being reported in this quanta magazine um, uh, that machine learning is amazing, amazingly ability to predict chaos. And then I ask him, when did we predict chaos? We actually found out that we cannot predict chaos. And actually, we are quoted in this article along with some other people, some other people claimed that they can predict chaos. And they said, not only these people predict chaos, but the Komuchakos lab in ETH Zurich also predicts chaos. And I'd like to say, we cannot predict uh, chaos. So don't believe what you read. And, but if you go back to these papers, you can actually see how much we can predict uh, chaos. So that's actually, uh, it was a very interesting um, uh, a very interesting uh, realization for me to, to see what people can, can write about your own work. Um, so uh, it does not, perhaps not yet, but that's something to, uh, to, to examine. So if we had predicted chaos, I would not be here. I will be making lots of money somewhere else. <laughs> but unfortunately, we cannot. So I'm here still trying to resolve this problem. So the question is, how can I, uh, can we extend the, this, this time scales that um, that the recurrent neural nets do, and, and, and this thing that we learn, how can we use it? So, so here's a, there is this idea from my friend Yanis Kevrakidis that has been staying in my mind for a long time. And the idea of Yanis is this equation-free framework. And uh, I'll, I'll show you the equation-free framework, and I'll tell you how uh, I can combine it uh, with these recurrent neural nets. 
So the idea of Yanis is that you have an expensive simulation. That's what he calls microscale because you, you resolve microscales. And then he says, you know, because you have some time steps of the microscale, what you can do is you can compress the data. And since you compress the data, you can actually have a snapshots of a latent space where you have a reduced order representation, much as I was having up to this time. So, so now you have this micro scale, and then what Yanni says now propagate along the micro scales. And that's what I have been doing with the RNN LSTMs as well, except that there is this key idea from Yanis that he says now return to the micro scale. And of course, that's a great idea to return to the micro scale, but the devil is in the details. How do you go from less information to more information? Going from more information to less, you can do some filtering. And, and I think this is, uh, has been a great idea, but the, the key problem was, how can you go back out from the Latin space into, um, into the uh, full dimensional space so that you can, when you start losing um, the, uh, the, the, the accuracy, um, you can go back out and try to harness it or, or strap it, bootstrap it on, on the fine scale simulation. There's many questions you can ask me here. How much do you decide? How long do you go? Uh, and so on and so forth. But um, keeping this idea in mind, um, uh, uh, I, I thought that there is a solution to this problem. And the solution to this problem occurred to me when I realized that the neural nets that we have been doing to learn the POD um, this is nothing else but a category of something that is called autoencoders. So autoencoders is the super uh, family of all this um, uh, PCA and all these other things that we were doing. So what do you do with an autoencoder? You can go to a latent space, but you can also go back out. Uh, you have the inverse operator to go to the fine scales. And not only that, but you can actually have decoders um, that um, they can actually give you a um, a mapping that can be probabilistic. Um, so this is kind of a generative network that you can have multiple um, realizations that are coming out from the uh, Latin space. And that's actually something that we are using later or today to do adaptivity in this uh, learned effective dynamics. And finally, in uh, the works of Yanis, um, the uh, integrators that he had in mind were usually uh, Euler or Ungekuta or things like that. I think when you do coarse graining, you are um, you have to include memory um, because you are, are are removing some dynamics that perhaps uh, remain into the system and they express themselves later. So you have to do integrators that include memory. And so these recurrent neural nets is the macro dynamics propagator. We do restricting averaging with uh, auto encoders and the lifting with the uh, encoders with the further restriction uh, decoders for the lifting. How, how does it work? Well, it works like that. Um, it's the same thing as the equation free, except that now uh, we're using encoders to go down and, and to propagate the system using RNNs. Then I use the decoders to go from micro to micro. I bootstrap it again, and I go uh, back and forth between these two representations. So you have to see that there is two um, uh, scales, the micro scale, the TM, where I do the expensive things, and the macro scale where I do the inexpensive thing. So the value of this thing is the larger you make this ratio, the better it is. Um, so, so, so how does it work? Now let's go back and look at the Kuramoto Sivasinski. Uh, Kuramoto Sivasinski, there is an interesting work that says effective dynamics lie on eight dimensional manifold, um, but how can you learn a propagator of these dynamics on, on these eight dimensional manifold is not something that people have done. And if you look actually the error that you do, if you do PCA, uh, you need about 20 modes that I had earlier to arrive to this mean square error. But when we did the autoencoders, actually it's almost that the autoencoders discovered this eight dimensional uh, manifold that the theoretical people have discovered. Now um, you can ask uh, how good it is. Well, here is how good it is. Here is a, if you do Lead only, um, you, never go, you never go back. This is the latent space. This is, this is only when you take your uh, reference solution and you do the encoder, and that's what the latent space would look like. And then if you do LED, where it means that you may want to reconstruct the full solution, you get this, and, and, and your eyes are good. The two things are not the same. 
But what is uh, very much the same is if you look at the phase space of the second and the first derivative of the um, unknown quantity u that you see that the LED actually is able to capture uh, relatively well uh, the reference uh, phase space. Now, uh, how good it is? Um, well, the speed up that you can have is up to two orders of magnitude. The error is going down, but I'm not very happy of how fast um, the error is going down. But this is uh, one of the results uh, that, that we had about this, this method. Then um, we uh, did what everybody does, which is Reynolds number at 100. And, and, and everybody does Reynolds number 100. And then they say we do turbulence. <laughs> so we also do Reynolds number of 100. And how good it is? Uh, well, it's pretty good. So, so the error, uh, we can go actually from uh, uh, a 3 by 512 by 1024 down to just four terms. Uh, so there is a pretty big restriction that I do for my Latin space. Uh, going from all these degrees of freedom to just four degrees of freedom, I'm able to recover um, the error. And I'm able to get two orders of magnitude speed up. My error is going down. And I'm actually remarkably able to capture my drag coefficient within 4%. So now you have to believe me, and I don't need to show you that I can do turbulence. <laughs> but it's not true because I asked my students, OK, we did 100. Now let's do 1,000. So we do Reynolds number of 1,000. And, and now we increase the DZ to, to 10. Uh, and I'm, I'm afraid uh, uh, it doesn't work so well. Uh, and actually, we get much larger errors. The errors in the drag, um, they remain in the order of 15 20%. Um, and then you can see that one of the things actually we are working on now is that the biggest errors that we make is around the surface of the body. And this kind of makes sense because that's actually where vorticity is being produced. So we are looking actually now to make adaptive autoencoders where you're trying to give more weight to data that are coming from the surface of the body uh, and not uh, from everywhere. But this implies some physical knowledge about the flow. And I'd like to argue that knowing the physics is super important when you're trying to do reduced order modeling, even when you do machine learning, perhaps even more uh, when you do uh, machine learning. There's a whole bunch of different papers. Uh, we have done this approach also. Another place where it works is very interesting is to do it in, in uh, molecular dynamics. Um, this is the LSTM as MSM, uh, where we complement the LSTM um, with, um, uh, with some kind of statistical model. So we don't blow up, but we capture the statistics, but still we are not so accurate. And there's lots of applications and, and we are exploring more and more um, this particular uh, method. So, um, so I have used uh, neural nets to, um, to, to try to predict the evolution of dynamical systems. There is another method these days that makes a lot of waves. And this is using neural networks for solving PDEs. Um, so what's the idea of this method? The idea of this method is that you have an unknown quantity, which is U. This U is obeying a, a PDE, and it has some boundary conditions over here. So you represent U as a neural network that has weights theta here. And now what you do is you create a loss function. And now the loss function is the PDE itself. It's the square of the PDE. And what is interesting, I think, and it's an interesting contribution, <coughs> is you can take also in this cost function also the boundary conditions, which means that also if you have data somewhere inside the domain, you can also put them into this uh, cost function. And then same as you would do for classical neural nets, you do the minimization. And then when you have theta, then uh, you know what's your solution everywhere. Of course, you have to sample your solution. And again, you sample your solution in X and T. So this method was developed actually by a guy in a, a university in Northwest Greece uh, by the name Isaac Elias Lagaris and, and, and his co-workers. Um, they did it for ordinary and partial differential equations. I recall um, seeing this paper, working on this stuff, and then I found it to be extremely more expensive than just solving the ODEs and the PDEs in, in the usual way. And, and now, uh, in 2019, um, uh, some other colleagues uh, came up with the so-called PINs that everybody knows, physics-involved neural nets. 
um, that they say similar ideas. They're not similar ideas, are the same ideas, except that PIMs use modern computational tools, PyTorch, TensorFlow, um, auto differentiation and all that, which is, which is it's, it's what it is. Um, and uh, about the more challenging dynamic problems, remember my comments about Reynolds number of 100. So do PIMs work? Well, uh, here's, here's what they look like. Uh, here's the Kuramoto Shivashinsky. And now what you will see here is I'm changing the locations that I'm putting the, the points where I interpolate. I'm changing all sorts of different things. Uh, I have the exact solution. And as I play around with the parameters, we actually found the pins to converge. So after playing along, you, you can get them to converge and to give you uh, the solution. What happened here? I said something against pins, and that's what happened. <laughs> So, so, so now I, it, it's up to this level by now. But anyway, now you can uh, you can actually do something else. You can you can change the problem, make it a little bit more chaotic and more challenging. And at least for my case, no matter what uh, conditions we got, I think the minimizers they got stuck in some kind of local minima, and the pills they didn't converge. Uh, it doesn't mean that if I don't choose some other uh, configuration that I have not tried, they may not work. But this is to show you that sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, but the thinking about, about pins, and that's actually uh, is great credit that goes to George Karnadakis, who's behind pins, is that uh, George thought that you can use this idea for inverse and ill post problems. So the idea is that, yes, you can do this equation. Yes, I told you that it has all these problems. But if you give me uh, different data, uh, I can put this data into the cost function and then uh, I can drive this machinery, and therefore I can solve inverse problems with sparse data, can do data simulation. It's a very interesting uh, approach. Now, um, we, we, we looked at it for some time, and then we were always struggling, how can we do better in terms of the speed? Because it takes time. So, so we came up with the following idea that I will show you in a second. Uh, uh, it's called optimizing the discrete loss. So what does it mean? So when you have a continuous problem, you write it like that. And if you take your numerical analysis course you, with a finite element, finite difference, you write a discrete approximation of your problem. And sometimes you may even get a linear uh, approximation, a linear operation that you have to solve. So now, um, usually, you go ahead and you use whatever numerical method you have, and you solve this problem. Okay. But now, what if we do the same trick um, that Lagaris introduced, where you take now the discrete version of your equation and you write it as a, as a minimization? And you actually can come to me and say, are you crazy? Uh, why should I do that since I can solve it? And, and actually, I will tell you, uh, you, you may think I'm crazy, obviously, because this is two orders of magnitude more expensive. But I remind you that I can have data that I can incorporate into my cost function. So I can do data assimilation quite easily. So the same way of what pins do, I can also do here. Except that here, the data have to come in points where I have grid points. They cannot be anywhere, but in principle, I can have patched grids. It's not, it's not a big issue. So now I can solve the same problem. Uh, and now I'm minimizing this function. And now my unknowns are not the weights of a neural net, but the solution itself. So I do a minimization. Uh, if I have a grid 100 by 100, I have 10,000 unknowns. I have 10, a minimization on a 10,000 space. But now uh, I can do um, second order methods, which um, uh, neural nets don't do so often. But the method is trivial to uh, operate. You can use auto differentiation to take all the derivatives, if you like. Uh, and, 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 and it basically, if you have linear problems, it amounts to basically matrix vector uh, multiplies. So it can become very fast because also the sum of these matrices are pretty sparse. So now let's compare uh, pins versus Odile. Um, so if you do the diffusion equation, um, that's what it would look like if you do it with pins. That's what it would look like if you do it with Odile. And, and uh, now let's look at some comparisons. Uh, let's look at the solution of the wave equation. Um, so this is pins with 700 parameters. We tried to do the same with Odile. Uh, here, of course, I did not smooth it out. I could smooth it out. I just wanted to, to remind you that pins, you have the solution everywhere. 
a deal, you have the solution on the grid, and then you have to interpolate. That's why I'm presenting it discrete because that's what I had. Of course, I can smooth, but that's, I didn't want to do that. But you can see here at the cross sections that I'm getting pretty good accuracy, if not better than actually what, what pins get. Now, the, the story is that we look at the error. And now if you look at Odil, uh, the blue and, and the green, the green is under right under the blue because we can do second order uh, numerical optimization. And the different um, dots that you see are different initializations for the pins. Depending on the initialization, you get a different error. Um, so you can, we took actually the average of, of, of what they get. Um, so the accuracy depends on initialization. Now the big story is that, that pins are five orders of magnitude more expensive than Odil, or Odil is a hundred thousand times faster than, than pins. And, and, uh, and, and it's very difficult to publish Odil because it doesn't have neural networks. So, so that's, that's another obstacle that uh, I have 25 years later. It was difficult before to publish with neural networks. 25 years later, it's difficult to publish without neural networks. But um, these are the results and, and, and the code is out there and you can uh, judge for yourself. Uh, we can do um, inverse problems. Uh, so for example, uh, we can solve the diffusion equation. And, and then um, if you give me uh, six cross sections or where you give me the solution, I can tell you, uh, not the uh, yeah, this is a nonlinear diffusion. I can tell you what is the nonlinear diffusion coefficient. So there is the, um, the, the exact and, and, the, and the approximate, the blue and, and the red, and that's what you get. You can also do inverse problems where you have advection. Again, you get the solution in these six slices, and you want to find out what is this nonlinear flux. Um, we can find it by doing this ordeal. Um, reconstruction of diffusion, um, this is 3,700 iterations here and much more each one of them versus 150 over here. And uh, we can do things like cavity problems where now uh, you're giving me the velocity in some random points inside the domain and then I'm able to tell you uh, uh, what, is the, what, is, what is the solution. So this is the, um, the second alloy um, that I wanted to present uh, where we are taking actually ideas that were brought to us from um, this uh, minimization of the square loss, which was actually inspired if, if pins had not made it so prominent, maybe we would not have looked back on this. So I, I find inspiration that things like that happen in, in, in machine learning. And I think that one should not necessarily stop there. So now alloy number three is the alloy that I am most excited about. And, and I'll try to introduce you um, why is it so um, powerful and why I'm so excited about this. So what is reinforcement learning? Uh, reinforcement learning, maybe some of you know it as Pavlov's dog and, and, and other uh, things. The idea is that you um, uh, are taking an, uh, uh, you're stimulated by something, you take an action and then you receive it a reward when you train your cat or your dog or your kids. That's what you, uh, you, you, you may do very often. So it's behavioral changes due to experiences. Um, so you have a stimulus action pattern that is rewarded. And so the actor who is rewarded when he does a particular action is conditioned to a particular uh, behavior. Um, one of the persons who did this actually, um, uh, it was pioneered uh, a lot of work was done on animals in pigeons in particular at Harvard. Two uh, pigeons are in a small ping pong table. One pigeon uh, pecks the ball as it comes toward him and knocks it toward the other pigeon. The other pigeon pecks the ball back across the table. If it goes past one pigeon, the other pigeon can eat. And if it goes the other way, the other pigeon eats. So there is a real, it's a real game. The, uh, Pigeon uh, is reinforced for a cross court shot if that is what gets the ball past his opponent. So, so it was actually there is amazing. So this is the voice actually of Skinner himself. Uh, they did some incredible uh, um, work. This was work financed by DARPA. Can you imagine why? <laughs> uh, so there is a great article that you can find in the MIT. Magazine. So this was um, MIT Technology Review. The idea was that you train these pigeons to be pilots in in in, um, 
rockets that can throw bombs or things like that. So at that time, there was guided missiles were not so uh, accurate. So the idea is that you train the pigeons on some kind of an image. Then um, you put the pigeons, and supposedly the pigeons are looking through the windows. Uh, and when they see this image, then they peck the window. And when they peck the window or a particular button, the, the, the bomb is getting released. Thank God this was never deployed. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the idea. Uh, and, and really, you can read more about this. It's a great article, MIT Technology Review uh, Pigeon Pilots. Um, now, um, Today, there is a lot of reinforcement learning in some of the best and the bravest and greatest that you see in uh, AI. Uh, so some of the best games are actually uh, are being trained on that. Um, so here, what you have is you have this um, uh, stick um, that is um, you learn. And then the state here is what, what is it that you, what is your stimulus? You have every piece of information about all the pixels. And then the action that you take is moving left and right, and then you can decide what is the reward that you get. Maybe you win the game at the end, but then you learn how to play a game. Here is a dynamical system. It has about 500 ODEs, and, and then these ODEs uh, represent certain animals, and then how fast the animals uh, go is becoming very important. Um, Chess and Go, they use reinforcement learning in their modern versions, and actually they're doing advanced games, uh, which is actually quite challenging. Uh, because now you don't have um, two-dimensional pixels, but um, you start to get into configuration. So you start to introduce um, uh, all sorts of very interesting uh, things about uh, challenges in the reinforcement learning. Now, um, reinforcement learning is, for those of you who have done dynamic programming, amounts to uh, having a Markov decision process. So you have a flow solver and the flow solver is being advanced, and then you are interfering with the flow solver by putting an action, and then you are observing something from the um, from the from the system, and then you are introducing a, a reward, which is your cost function here. And this is you always look that you don't have an immediate reward, but you're looking to optimize in the time horizon. And a very important thing that distinguishes reinforcement learning from dynamic programming is that the functions here that I have, this, this calligraphic G and the calligraphic R, um, you can observe them, but you don't know them analytically. Uh, so what you can do is you can sample them, but you cannot go back as in dynamic programming and do gradients uh, and everything. So it's a, it's a stochastic optimization uh, approach. More specifically, um, there is something called policy gradient. Uh, what is policy gradient? Um, here is the, the machine, the, the agent, if you like. Uh, and then this agent uh, is receiving some information about the environment, the observer state. The agent is taking an action. Uh, and then there is a, a reward that's coming back to the agent. And then this reward is an expectation, which is an expectation that depends on the policy that this agent has. It says the policy is a probability distribution that says, given this state, what is the action that you take? So the output that I have here uh, of this policy, I represent it as a recurrent neural network. And then the output that I have is a mean. And uh, here I saw it as a variance, but a covariance matrix. And, and, and then I use a Gaussian and I predict, I, I, I learn a mean and a covariance. And then I'm sampling this Gaussian probability distribution to act, okay? So I have to train my recurrent neural nets to learn the mean and a covariance of a Gaussian probability distribution. How do we do that? Well, we play many, many games and we record all these uh, results. We get something we call experiences. Um, now, after I do, or after I collect all these experiences, um, uh, I'm trying to see, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna learn every game from scratch, but given that I have played all these past games, can I use these past experiences? This is called experience replay um, and, and uh, you, you, you sort all these different things, but if you look at it from a physics uh, perspective, this experience you play is nothing but important sampling. You have the online strategy from which you win to sample. This is very expensive to calculate. So what you do instead is you go and you sample from another probability distribution that you have already created. And of course, there's two things you have to observe. It is uh, when, you do when you do important sampling. Um, first of all, 
uh, when you do this ratio. So what you do is you do this expectation under the online policy. But instead of doing the online policy, you, you do it uh, on, 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 on some kind of experiences. So you have to make sure that this ratio uh, between these two policies at the particular states and actions does not go to zero or to infinity. And also when you retrieve things from memory, you wanna have some similarity between the two probability distributions. And, and, and what we did is we, um, uh, we, we took care of these two things by rejecting samples when the um, ratio was outside the trust region. Uh, we penalized um, uh, the behavior based on a KL divergence between these probability distributions. Uh, we call this remember and forget experience replay. You always have to come up with a cool name to get published. And, and, and this was published uh, finally in the I, ICML. Um, and, and it's pretty good. So on, uh, as you can see here, we compare um, um, this um, uh, guy here with this guy and you can clearly see this guy on the right is much better. This is our guy. <laughs> so, so I'll show you in a second. It's indeed much better. Uh, I just admire the work of these people. So it gave me particular uh, pleasure to see that we can do uh, better work. Actually, if you see what this guy does, he comes up with a very interesting policy, which is that you kick yourself and you fly, and while the other one keeps walking. So don't try this at home. But the 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 way you can see these two things is that you can look at the uh, the reward that you can have, we compared it in a whole bunch of different of these benchmarks that they have on the OpenAI gym. Uh, we found uh, that we are doing um, uh, very well. And actually we kept comparing uh, the kullback leibler divergence between, um, uh, between uh, the, 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 the probabilities that you use from your experiences and your current online one. And for us, it's constructed like that, that it goes down. Um, for the others, uh, we never found it to, to really go down. And the other thing which is important, you cannot take any of these other algorithms, at least for us, and do it in fluid mechanics problems. We found that um, just taking, in, in when you do pins or other neural nets, you take PyTorch, TensorFlow, you plug it in and play. Uh, uh, reinforcement learning is a different animal that is not plug in and play. That's at least was our experience. So now what we did with that, we did a whole bunch of things in control. Uh, one of the things we did is we taught some uh, fish to swim together. Uh, this is a fish that produces vortices and, and we use reinforcement learning in order to teach this fish to extract energy from the vortices on the wake. Um, this fish actually here extracts energy from um, uh, both vortices. Um, I will not go into the details uh, these are full 3D DNS. It's one um, for each fish about 5,000. Um, and, and, and we also do things in microfluidics where um, it, we take this magnetic artificial bacterial flagella, they're called. Uh, they're magnets uh, that are, uh, when they are subjected to a magnetic field, they spin because they have a flagella. If you don't do control, they will marginalize because they will push aside from the red blood cells. We want to keep them in the middle because we want to hit, hit big obstacles. So this was done um, uh, with multi with with reinforcement learning. Designed to and 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 we do it also on different things with the Dabiri group at Caltech. We are training also drones to to do different things, a um, whole bunch of different applications. But as a last thing, the one that I am most excited about, and which is this alloy where I put. We put a whole bunch of things together. And, and, and now I'm not gonna do control, but I'm gonna do prediction of complex systems. So lots of you are doing reduced order modeling. So here is a very bad uh, representation of reduced order modeling. I have uh, an equation, take it the bin and Navier Stokes, anything you want. I um, discretize it on a mean field and a fluctuations. And therefore um, this is usually what comes out of it. Um, and what we do uh, in a lot of the fluids modeling, uh, also in molecular dynamics, we try to create closures in terms of mean field quantities that I can uh, resolve. Now, the idea that we had was to do, um, to do reinforcement learning to learn this type of stuff. And, and now um, there is a certain issue. And the issue is, what is this uh, state that I am observing? So if I do a typical LES simulation, if I do, um, let's say a 16 cube simulation, 
uh, then 16 cube gives me uh, a number of about 7,000. So that means that I have to observe 7,000 uh, states. And, and that's a very high dimensional space that I have to, uh, to be able to capture. So then instead, here comes the second key idea from this work, is when you look at the grid points uh, of, a, of, a, of a PDE solver, these grid points, um, when they're approximating the PDE, um, they learn what to do um, in order, they don't learn, you tell them what to do in order to resolve the PDE. But now here's the idea, what if these grid points are no longer only grid points, but they're also agents that are learning. So I can, uh, uh, in this first, I can put agents in every part of my domain. And what's the advantage now? Instead of having a one agent observing all the states of my domain, I can have multiple agents that are only looking at their neighborhood. And then hopefully the dimensionality of the space in which they have to learn to operate is smaller. And at the same time, I remain uh, uh, local in the learning uh, that I do. Um, that's it, the idea. Well, of course, there's a lot of things that go into uh, um, doing this thing to work. Um, so, so what's the idea is that, um, first of all, when you're doing reinforcement learning, you are learning uh, while you are acting. It's not the same as with neural nets that you are uh, learning something and then you're plugging it in and then the system behaves differently and then you have to take it out and plug it in again and so forth. Here, you're learning as, as you're going ahead. And then the hope is also that you don't need information uh, from every grid point because your reward can be anything uh, you want. And also, um, uh, since you're not taking gradients that you need in neural nets, you can use uh, reference quantities that are coming also from uh, experiments. So um, this is something we, we, we published a couple of years ago. I'll show you how it works in the case of a turbulent flow. Uh, so this is homogeneous turbulent flow. So what we do, we have an agent that is uh, controlling the, the Smagorinsky uh, coefficient. It learns this Smagorinsky coefficient. How does it learn? Well, we took us some time to find out what this should be um, the, the different states. We found that we need to have um, the dissipation and then the energy uh, on, on certain modes. And also the very important thing was to use the eigenvalues of, of the gradient of the velocity field and the eigenvalues of the Laplacian of the velocity field, because these things kind of guaranteed for us that we have isotropic uh, homogeneous slope. So if you had given here as velocities in different parts of the domain, we never learned, we never got it to, to learn anything. And here, um, we're using as a reward the uh, difference between the output of our simulations and, and, and the DNS. Um, so now we train on different Reynolds numbers, Ari Lambda. So we train on, on this set of 65, 76, up to 163. And, and then there's different policies that we played. Uh, I don't, don't, don't uh, I will, I will show you the blue and, and, and the yellow. Uh, the blue was our best uh, policy um, th that we got here. And you can see that is able to get the results of the DNS um, uh, quite well. It's actually seems to be better than any Smagorinsky uh, type of model. This is the error that you have done here. And the other thing which was interesting here, I trained in the whole bunch of Reynolds numbers and then we are able to extrapolate, uh, but also we get good results when we train in only one Reynolds number, 111 over here. That's why the blue and the yellow are the same, but you can see that it extrapolates um, relatively well uh, in other uh, places. Uh, very quickly to tell you um, that we actually took that uh, to learn wall models uh, in, uh, um, in, in LES. Um, um, I'm, I'm not gonna go very, I'm gonna go very fast here just to tell you um, uh, the results that at some point um, we trained the, the thing up to um, this Reynolds number over here. And then we tried to extrapolate. This was when we used as training um, a bad state. Uh, here we used a velocity field um, uh, in the near wall region from DNS. And this failed completely. 
Uh, and this is when we used the smart uh, state, which was actually giving us the equivalent coefficients of the law of the world. So we trained up to Reynolds number 10 to the fourth, and then this was able to extrapolate uh, quite uh, significantly up to 10 to the six, uh, having uh, relatively uh, little error in terms of percentages. And also, we also trained it in a channel flow, and then uh, we're able to uh, predict quite well the friction coefficient in, in turbulent uh, boundary layers. So I'd like to conclude. Uh, these are the, the things that I told you today. Um, there is open issues about theory, about um, parameters, applications, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, there is a, um, a lot of things that we are excited about. There is a lot of open problems. I'm very excited about trying to find fusion between algorithms and, and that we have been using in scientific computing and also some of the tools that are coming out in machine learning. And I think it's very, very exciting times for uh, younger people in particular to, to learn these two things and to try to come up with, with new mathematics. And, and I will be extremely interested to see uh, what, what people are coming up. Um, and, and I'm very hopeful we'll solve some really cool uh, problems by going through this path. Um, closing, uh, I'd like to, uh, to to put down a bet. This is it's Powerball Day, right? So these are thousands. <laughs> these are thousands in Reynolds numbers. And, and I'd like to argue, um, this is flow past an impulsively started cylinder. When I did my PhD, I did it at Reynolds number of 10,000. Uh, and now with all the computers, et cetera, that we have, I asked my students to do the same flow uh, using adaptive mesh refinement at um, 25, 50, and 100,000. So this is the amount of money that I bet that no machine learning algorithm can do these simulations um, and with, with just numerical methods and, and, and supercomputers and so on. You can uh, see wonderful physics. The, the flow at high Reynolds numbers is, is pretty spectacular. There is a lot of recirculation that is happening, a lot of um, instabilities that are coming out from the separation. Uh, and, and I would leave it with this image and I will thank you and I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Like if anybody needs to leave, feel free, but we have room for another half hour, so we will take questions. For those of you online, um, if you raise your hand, I believe I should be able to unmute you, or if you unmute yourself, we should be able to hear you, or feel free to type into the text box. Uh, but we'll start here if there's any questions here in the in the in person audience. Yeah. In the uh, in the uh, uh, example that you showed about the uh, Siwamoto or Kuramoto. She was in KS. Yeah. yeah, KS equation. Uh, so you had a comparison with uh, uh, a finite difference solution, right? And uh, I'm thinking like uh, uh, it must have been tricky to do the comparison itself because it's a chaotic system. And if you are like change the time step or change anything about the method, the solution. The finite difference solution was converged. If, yes, I, if, but, I, uh, if I increase the, no, oh, there's a dissipation there. There is the, it's not in VC. Okay. There is a dissipation, there is a length scale. Uh, and, and for the grids that I used, it was resolved. It was resolved. Okay. Yeah, so I could consider it as a truth. I understand your point okay. that uh, you could have, uh, and that's actually, it's a very interesting point that maybe this, this um, recurrent neural nets don't have a dissipation mechanism inside. And, and uh, you can actually see that when we introduce this, um, um, MSM method. Uh, it's a method by Maida and, and, and Subsys that has some kind of, it's a Wiener process that has some kind of dissipation which stayed in the in the region of, of, of the equation. Uh, and and uh, But the RNN is actually, it's interesting. What is the equation they're solving? Right. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. A very exciting talk. Um, so it's it's related to the uh, my question is related to the reinforcement learning part. Mm -hmm. um, so in in an MDP you have a, like a very specific structure, right? The current state depends on the previous action. The previous action depends on the state. Mm -hmm. that and so on. But so when you were solving the closure the closure problem in, in in mechanics, how did that sort of restriction uh, like play into? 
because I would assume that that would mean that your current finer scale depends only on the coarser scale uh, solution in the previous time step, and so on. So, 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 so what? what uh, yeah. So what? I mean, I'm I'm learning a policy, right? So what is the? I'm I'm doing many iterations. Um, I don't depend only. I receive information in one step. I, I react, but this information also is 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 compounded because I'm trying to maximize long-term rewards. So it's not exactly a mark of decision process only. Right. So there is some kind of memory in in, in my system. I see. Uh, okay. Maybe we we can talk. Uh, I'm no, but I'm happy to understand. Maybe I don't understand. So, so, so I'm thinking some Markov decision process is just a little bit different from a Markov process, right? Where because you have the ability to make decision in each step. That's right. I do an action. Uh, which, yeah, and that brings in um, some limited, I guess, memory, but not of not more than two time steps back, because you can always marginalize over your decision to get back a Markovian process. Okay, continue and then so so would that um so I'm trying to understand what, how that would change um the uh the homogenization process or the closure like when you try to apply this problem, the setup to a closure problem. I mean you show my results. Yeah. Um so for me the, the most difficult the thing that I found to be the most important in this um uh in this uh in these closures um what the states what I, what kind of states uh, do i use uh so the important thing was to find out the states so once uh we tried thousands of different combinations of states to get it to work uh and then um the states that i showed you were the ones that they were the better ones uh, but i don't know if this uh refers to to this issue of mdp here uh, in the case of the controller uh, one of the things that we do um, is sometimes we consider as a state the previous action uh, so we consider as a state a previous action so that gives us some kind of memory we call it um, proprioception like you you have some awareness of, of what you have done uh, in your states, uh, which I don't know if it breaks this mark of decision process because the previous action that you took depending on a state before that and, and, and so on and so forth. So there's memory yeah. that, that we have included in there. So somehow maybe another way to answer your question is like maybe we are not so respectful in all this uh, treating it as a strict mark of decision process that we're using all sorts of degrees of freedom until we find what works uh, maybe that's and, and i don't have a theory um, that this is better than doing it one way or another i think it would be wonderful if someone has theory for that stuff yeah yeah so i, I have a question related to i think the second point so you have the discretized PDE and boundary condition, and maybe also data in the loss function, and then do the optimization to find the, the function value at some specific uh, points. So my question is: so suppose we already have the P, uh, PDE and boundary condition, so the problem is well called right? So we suppose have a unit solution, but right now we have more information like data to that, and then the, the optimization. So can comment on what the solution we actually get from the It's not necessarily well-posed problem. Yeah. It's not a proper uh, well-posed problem. Um, I totally agree with you. Uh, and, but the same issue that I have in Odil, you have also in PIMS. It's actually one more criticism of this approach where you start to introduce um, more points uh, left and right. There is empirical evidence that this thing works, but indeed, I agree with you, is not a proper, well-posed inverse uh, problem. It's a, it's an engineering fix that you do. Yeah. Can you comment on, for example, that solution we got from Keen or, 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 or the method you proposed and the, the solution from, from the numerical method? Indeed? 
they probably have some minor issue, a minor difference or something. Uh, I can imagine that they can be uh, cases like that. Um, I showed you some of the results. Um, I, I'm happy if you have a particular problem that you have in mind, I'm happy to try it. Uh, be very curious. Uh, if you have a particular problem that you have in mind, be glad to be happy to, to look at it. But indeed, this, this process is not well posed. And, and uh, either you do it with neural nets, either you do it with, a, yes. with the other method, nothing changes in terms of the well posed, the theoretical well posedness of the problem. All I'm saying is that if you do it with pins, you can do it 100,000 times faster by doing it the other way. That's all I'm saying. I have one question. Yeah, please. Um, so going back to your discussion of being chaotic systems, yeah. first of all, I appreciate your candor in talking about the challenges of going from 100 to 1,000, say, so yeah. my students are laughing. I think I'm like, talking about this all the time. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess I'm interested in your perspective um, in the bottleneck of systems like what is what is the limitation is it just that it's got these, these positive lab coefficients is it our ability to represent these things at low dimension is it training the networks like where where's the model that can deal i think it's in the order more or less that you describe them i think training the neural net is not necessarily the main bottleneck uh, i think finding the the right reduced order data or uh, reduced order models to do uh, the training, I think this is the more uh, important, uh, more, more important problem. So in the case of the Kuramoto Shiva Sinsky that I showed, there we know that there is an eight dimensional manifold. Um, then we do these uh, autoencoders, we find that at eight dimensions, uh, things start to saturate. So we say, okay, this is a good one. And then we run the recurrent neural nets, and then you see that you have uh, some kind of an attractor in a sense. And then in the case of the attractor, these things uh, are going to work. I think if you don't have an attractor uh, or if you don't train over the whole attractor, you have no hope, as far as I'm concerned, for these things to work uh, out of the blue. It's just a tool. Uh, maybe you can uh, use them to help you and then you can add uh, something to it. Uh, um, but yeah, I don't think it's... Um, only by themselves. I don't see how they can predict um, chaotic systems. Yeah, you need to complement them with physics. We need to complement them with, with interesting ideas about reduced order modeling that are physics based, things you do, and, and others here. Uh, so I, I think this should be something that we should not lose in favor of only that way. Yeah. Thank you. Any final questions here? Yeah. Um, so, in, in I guess predicting chaotic systems, do you do you think predicting what uh, predicting chaotic systems? Yeah. Do you think the objective should be to like track a trajectory exactly, or do you think it's predicting like the statistical information? It depends on who you are asking. If you are one of these um, encryption companies that are using chaotic systems to do encryption. Uh, in this case, some of these companies are interested in knowing the exact uh, trajectory. Maybe if you are an engineer, you are happy uh, just capturing the, uh, the, the attractor of, of the solution or capturing the statistics. If you are doing control, uh, maybe the statistics uh, is enough. So it always depends on what is, what is the question that you are uh, posing to, you, to your method. What do you expect to get out of it? I think uh, capturing the statistics is uh, doable. Uh, it's probably there is more hope to to do that. Uh, capturing the exact trajectories, I think, is very very challenging. Uh, and I don't know if we should be looking for that. After all, yeah. All right, that's a good place to stop. So let's thank Petro some more time. Thank you.